when we take refuge in the Buddha and the Dharma and the Sangha, what are we trying to protect? We're trying to protect our well-being. We take refuge in them because they give good examples of how to protect well-being, how to give rise to well-being and how to protect it. So where does our well-being come from? As the Buddha said, there are three kinds of food for the mind. There's consciousness itself, and then there's contact, contact at the senses, contact in the mind itself, and then our intentions. And of those three, the, the last is the most important. Because it's our intentions that drive what we do and say and think. And this, of course, is going to give rise either to pleasure or pain, well-being or ill. So that's where real food is. You know, we do get some, some satisfaction out of a sense of well-being at contact or consciousness of pleasure. That's when we're sitting here and meditating. This contact at the breath. And when the breath feels comfortable, the mind has a sense of feeling well fed. Because otherwise, it's going to go off and look for who knows what as its food. But if I have a sense of well being here, okay, that is one level of feeding the mind. But it's the intention that stays with the object of concentration. That's the real food here. The realization that you know that you're doing something good, something that's good not only right now, but also is going to have long-term good results. That's nourishing for the mind. It creates good habits. So whatever qualities help us focus on creating more of this good food for the mind, those are our treasures and those are things we want to protect as well. The Buddha has a list of seven treasures. And they all focus on what's necessary to protect the intentions of the mind. It starts off with conviction, i.e. conviction that the Buddha really was awakened, and the implication there being that true happiness is something that human beings can find, because that's the message of his awakening, the message that applies to us directly. Uh, the levels of happiness that are available are many and varied, but there's some some that are, lie beyond anything you can imagine. It's all possible through our actions, and so if you have conviction that your actions really matter and that can make a difference like this, that conviction keeps you more focused on making sure that you're feeding off the right kind of intentions right now. And there's virtue. Shame and compunction, these three qualities go together. Virtue is the promise you make to yourself that you're not going to harm anybody, and then you stick with that promise. This requires mindfulness, it requires alertness, it develops qualities that are good for the concentration, because you have to keep your precepts in mind, your, your original intention in mind. And you have to be alert to what you're doing to make sure that it does stay in line with your intention. John Fung had a student one time. She saw all her friends taking the precepts, so she was going to take them too. She came to the monastery, and one afternoon she walked past a guava tree, and the guavas looked just right, ripe and ready to eat. And so she popped one right in her mouth, and John Fung happened to see her and said, Hey, what, what happened to your precept there? What's that in your mouth? And she suddenly realized that she'd totally forgotten what the eight precepts meant. And as he comforted her, he said, Well, make sure you hold on to the one precept, which is the precept of the mind. And that's the one that covers all the rest. If you keep in mind the fact that you have a promise to yourself, that's what enables you to stick with it. Now, shame and compunction help here, too. Shame is when you 
think of doing something that would be against the precepts or anything that would be unskillful at all. You have a sense that it's beneath you. You would be ashamed to do that. This is a healthy sense of shame that goes with self-esteem. The same with compunction. That's the realization that if something you do is unskillful, then it's going to lead to suffering down the line for yourself or for other people. And just that sense of conscience holds you back. These qualities protect your good metal food. Then there's learning, i.e. learning from the Dharma, which gives you ideas about what's skillful, what's not skillful, and how to develop what's skillful and abandon what's not. Generosity, realizing that you have more than enough. In other words, through your good intentions, you've been creating lots of good things, and you can share them with other people. That lightens the mind, it expands the mind. There's a sense of well-being that comes with that. And that well-being, again, becomes food for the mind that encourages you to stick with good intentions all the more. And finally, there's discernment. When you really see what is actually skillful and what's not, and you pursue that into more and more subtle levels. Now, these are the things we want to protect, because they protect our good actions. These are our treasures. So as we're meditating, we're going to keep this, keep this in mind, that these are qualities that we need to protect to make sure that our well-being really is solid. Now to develop these treasures, the same principles apply as in the Buddha's instructions on how to become wealthy on the material level. You start out by having initiative. You don't just wait for these things to come your way or wait for other people to do them. You realize, I've got to develop them myself. And then you protect, i.e. you maintain what you've got. You don't just look at the mind and watch things coming and going and seeing something good coming and say, well, I don't want to be attached to it, and I let it go. If something good comes, you want to maintain it. In fact, that's one of the duties of mindfulness, to give rise to good states in the mind and then to maintain them when they're there. We've read so much about insight into things arising and passing away that we forget that for that insight to have any value at all, it has to be based on a mind that's really solid. So as you work to get the mind to settle down, and it's pleasant work. It may be frustrating at times, but at least you're not getting dirty, you're not sweating, you're not under the hot sun, and you're not doing anything that you would be ashamed of. You're developing your insight, you're developing your discernment as you get the mind to settle down, because you've got to figure out what's keeping the mind from settling down and what you can do to get around that so that the mind does have a sense of well-being with the breath. That's something you want to maintain. Once you've got it, hold on to it. And then you take some pleasure in it. This is an important part of the meditation. The Buddha talks about getting the mind to settle down. And then once there is a sense of well-being that comes, and this first step is just sense of well-being that comes when you've let go of unskillful qualities and there's a sense of refreshment in the mind. It's not being driven around. There's a sense of spaciousness. You let that sense of well-being spread throughout the whole body. The Buddha's image is of a bathman. Back in those days they didn't have bars of soap like we have now. They had a kind of soap powder, which they would mix with water and make a kind of a dough, and then you'd rub that over your skin and wash it off. And when you make the dough, you take the powder and you mix it with water and you mix it just right. It's like kneading water into bread flour. You want to make sure that the whole ball of dough is moistened. In the same way, with your body, once there's a sense of well-being, you work it through the different parts of the body. 
You start with one spot, but you don't stay there because you're trying to develop a concentration that's solid. And the most solid kind of concentration is one that has a large framework that doesn't get knocked over by things. If your concentration is just one tiny point, then when you change the point, the concentration is gone. But if you've got a sense of the whole body, then as the breath calms down, you're not lost. When the breath stops, you're not lost. You're right here with the body. And as the Buddha says, you indulge in that. You take pleasure in that. This corresponds with the Buddha's third principle for, for gaining wealth, is that you learn how to enjoy it in moderation. In other words, you're not so stingy that you just hide all your money under a mattress and eat nothing but dried bread and water. You take some of your wealth and you learn to enjoy it, because that enjoyment is a kind of food for the mind, the, enjoy the food that comes from contact. And even though it's not as nourishing as the food that comes from intention, still it's good for the mind. It keeps you going on the path, because otherwise things start getting dry. And then your attitude towards pleasure and pain gets all skewed. So you don't want to be too frugal at the same time. Of course, you don't want to be too extravagant. You live in a way that's just right. And here, just right means getting your pleasure from the concentration, but not getting so distracted from the breath that you just wallow around in the pleasure, because otherwise you're going to lose the source of the pleasure to begin with. The Buddha said the sense of well-being comes from staying attentive to the breath, being alert to the breath. So keep the, the cause going and the results will come. You have just the right attitude toward the pleasure. Then the fourth quality for developing wealth, which applies both outside and inside, is having good friends. And these friends, again, can be outside and inside, too. The good friends who advise you on how to be more generous, how to be more virtuous, how to have more conviction, how to develop more discernment, in other words, developing more of your true inner treasures. And your inner friends, of course, are the members of the mind. All those voices you've got, the ones that you can identify as being the ones that are helpful, that really do have your well-being in mind, long-term well-being. You learn to hang out with them and not listen to the other voices that would tear things down. So the quality we're trying to protect as we take refuge and the qualities of the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha is our own well-being, which comes from feeding the mind well on its real treasure, which is its good intentions or skillful intentions. And then all these other qualities help. They become treasures, too, that you want to protect. You want to give rise to them, and then you protect them. Use them wisely. And learn how to look at your life this way. This is what's important to protect. And you realize that when you see that this is what needs to be protected, then your concern for outside things gets less and less. In other words, your fear that things might be stolen or you may die. You realize those things are not nearly as important as the treasures you've got inside. Because these treasures go beyond death. It makes you a lot less prey to fears or people who want to prey on your fears. And it gives you a sense of independence. You're independently wealthy. Because everything you need is right inside. The sources of your wealth are inside. The wealth itself is inside. And the well-being that comes from Maintaining your wealth and using it wisely, that's inside, too. The good thing, of course, is that once you've got this inner wealth, you can share a lot with others. And you've got good things to share. So when the question comes up, where do you want to invest your time? And the Buddha actually uses images of investment and wealth. 
in his teachings. Where do you want to invest your time and energy? Right here, developing these good qualities of the mind, the food for the mind, i.e. your skillful intentions. That's where time and energy is invested pays off. This is a message we have to keep in mind, and we have to keep, in, keep it in mind very firmly, because there are so many other messages out there. People want our money, people want our support for, for who knows what. They don't have our well-being in mind. I mean, the sign of the Buddha's compassion is that he was thinking about our well-being and how we can give rise to our well-being and maintain it. He, that's what he taught. That's a message that's worth listening to. The other message is just let them go. Because your well-being is something you have to take care of. Don't let yourself get waylaid by people who don't have your well-being in mind. <laughs>